Well, good morning again. Uh, welcome to Cross Community Church. Welcome to those of you watching online, those of you who are at our Pecola campus, enjoyed getting to fellowship with some of your men this weekend. Uh, how, how many of you have seen the show Chopped? You know what I'm talking about? It's one of those cooking shows. I don't know why people watch cooking shows. Uh, they're super boring to me. But this one is a little bit intense, right? Because uh, the way that Chopped works is they bring in all of these super talented chefs from all over the United States, maybe around the world, uh, and, and they, they put them together in competition. They've got a certain amount of time. They're going to prepare a three-course meal. And the reason the show is exciting is because they have like a little mystery basket of ingredients that they have to incorporate into the dishes that they're going to make. And so um, these really great chefs, they get to work and, and, and they start cooking. And generally, they're going to give them things like um, fiddlehead ferns and pig's blood, just the most random ingredients you've ever seen. And it's like, here you go, make a gourmet meal. Now, the reason I, I don't really like watching the show all of that much isn't because uh, of what they're cooking with or even to watch their skills. They are pretty impressive. Uh, I really wish I could eat some of the things that they make. The reason I don't like the show is that I cannot stand the judges. You all know what I'm talking about? Like, they don't do anything on the entire show but sit there and criticize. Like, here's, here's a guy that had, like, bitter melons to work with. And you're like, yeah, I think the texture's off a little bit. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, did you see what these people have done with absolutely nothing to work with? And so I don't like the show because the judges, well, they're just irritated. They're kind of, like, critical and judgy. And I, I don't super enjoy um, their tone. Now, um, if you've lived very long in America, you probably know how we feel about people being judgy. Maybe you've been a little bit judgy. Maybe you've felt a little bit judged. Today, we are going to be talking about uh, the topic of judging. And uh, the passage we're going to be looking at is one of the most often quoted but most misunderstood passages in the New Testament. If, if you've lived in the Christian realm for very long or even outside the Christian realm, you've probably heard people quote the verse. They like to quote it in KJV because it makes you sound more official, right? They say, judge not lest ye be not judged. We don't ever talk like that in, in our country, except for when we're telling people don't be judging us, right? We're bringing the king's English to bear on their judgment. So Jesus is going to tell us today in Matthew chapter 1, judge not so that you will not be judged. We're going to be looking at this passage again because it's very, very misunderstood in our culture. I want to give you a few examples of this. John Shore of the Huffington Post uh, quoted the verse we're going to be looking at, Matthew chapter 7, 1, don't judge so you won't be judged, uh, in an article titled, The Best Case for Not Condemning Homosexuality. And in this article, he scolds uh, Christians for daring to take a literal view of the Bible, like the Bible means what it says. He scolds Christians for that and for having the audacity to share such a view with those who would disagree. You're not supposed to judge. Doesn't the Bible say, judge knowledge? And here you are, Christians, judging other people and their decisions. Carol Martin, who's a columnist at the Chicago Sun-Times, she opened her July 17th rebuke of pro-life activists with the same logic. How could you possibly judge a, a, a mother, a woman, for what she wants to do? Now, the sin here isn't what would happen with the child. The sin here is in judging June of this year, MSN posted a video chronicling Jamie and Shaba, titled, I'm about to marry my transgender best friend. And the, the tagline was, love, don't judge. For their wedding, uh, they basically said, anyone who's not here to celebrate us and what we're doing, if you disagree with what's happening, you should just stay home. You should love and don't judge. Now, those are a few unique occurrences. But here's the most common one. Last week, somewhere in America, this passage was used by a hard-hearted, stiff-necked Christian in defense of their own sinful behaviors. You know where the world learned to misquote and misapply this verse? From the church. That we like to use it when it's going to defend us and our behaviors, our actions, our attitudes. We don't like it when the world would use it. But we like to use it even to defend our own sinful 
behaviors. And so I ask the question again, what does Jesus mean when he says here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, do not judge so that you will not be judged? Now, I'm not ready to give you a definition. I need to tell you a few more things uh, that judging is not, all right? So the first thing that Jesus is not saying here, he's, saying, he's not saying you can't have a career as a judge in a courtroom, right? That's not what he's speaking about. It would not be sinful to run for a judge, preside over court hearings. Jesus is not saying we shouldn't discern what is true. If someone is trying to sell you oceanfront property in Arizona, I, I beg, please just, just go visit first. Make sure it's all that you hoped it would be, right? We should discern what is true, what is right. Like that's an important thing as believers. The final thing this is not telling us is that we shouldn't make moral judgments. John chapter 7, 24, Jesus says, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. We're going to be held accountable for our actions, for our choices, for doing right and wrong. Throughout the scriptures, things are called sinful or righteous. And so we should be making moral judgments. Philippians 3.2, beware of the dogs, of the evil workers, of the false circumcision. These were false teachers kind of infiltrating the church. And we should beware. We should make judgments about what's being taught, about what is true, what is right, what is moral, what is wrong. So again, I ask this question, we're kind of where we started. What did Jesus mean when he told us, do not judge? I'll give it to you in a sentence. What Jesus was telling us here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, when he says, do not judge so that you will not be judged, he is warning against self-righteous hypocrisy. Self-righteous hypocrisy. Where I build myself a little pedestal of my own self-righteousness. I'm a pretty good guy. I don't know if you know that. I'm a pretty good guy. And so what I do is I step up on my pedestal. And what in inevitably happens when we step up on a pedestal is we start to look down on other people. We're a little better than they are. They're a little less than we are. We start looking down on them. And Jesus says, no, no, no. Do not judge lest you be not judged or you will be Judge. So the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, in the time that Jesus is preaching this Sermon on the Mount, the time where he sits down to teach us how to live as disciples in the kingdom of God, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were kind of the religious leaders. They taught the others, this is how to, have, uh, this is how to walk in the faith appropriately. Now the trouble with the scribes and the Pharisees is not that they understood the law really well. It's not that they even strove to be fairly faithful. It's that they became self righteous. The Old Testament and the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, um, if you've read the laws there, they are many. And the scribes and the Pharisees probably could have quoted all of them. But they didn't even stop there. That was known as the Torah, the written law. They also developed what is known as the Mishnah, the spoken law, which is the explanation of how we're supposed to live out the written laws. And so they were very devout, very religious. They wanted to be obedient to the law. And when you're that hardcore you're going to find someone else who isn't. Have you ever been on that fad diet? It was the one that everyone in the whole world should have been on. You didn't go on a diet. You made a lifestyle change, right? You're so hardcore. You're all in it. And suddenly, you're, you're starting to look at everyone else and wonder why they can't just kind of get on board like you. Why can't they get their stuff together? Like, why don't, oh my gosh, I can't believe he's eating. Did you see that piece of cake? Like, look how big. The, you start looking down on the choices of everybody else because you've got your stuff together. And then two weeks later, you're the one cutting the big piece of cake. I thought this was lifestyle change. Like, what happened? Right? <laughs> what happens when we are rule followers, when we gauge our lives on what we're doing or not doing, um, when we're doing pretty well, we can easily become self-righteous. That's what happened with the Pharisees. Matthew 23, verses 1 through 4, Jesus spoke to the crowds and his disciples, and he said this about the scribes and Pharisees. He said, Scribes and Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. This was a seat of judgment. Je Moses used to stand and judge all the people. They would line up. They needed to hear from him. Am I in the right or am I in the wrong? So the scribes and the Pharisees, they placed themselves there in the seat of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you to do, um, go ahead and do it and observe it. But do not do according to their deeds, for they say things, and then they don't do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. 
See, the trouble with the scribes and the Pharisees and the trouble with you and with me is not, if we're judging according to the Scriptures, that we're using the wrong standard. The Pharisees weren't using the wrong standard. It's that they were hypocrites. That they applied one standard to other people and another standard to themselves. Y'all remember the, the, the parable of the Pharisee and the publican? The publican's the tax collector. Where they come into the temple and the Pharisee, he, he walks in. And now, now Jesus is clarifying why he's telling the parable. He, he says this in, in uh, Luke 18 verse 9. He says, he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they viewed others with contempt. So in the parable, Jesus paints the picture of the Pharisee walking in to the temple. He's standing up and he's praying and, and he's just kind of letting everyone know where they stand. And he says, God, I thank you that I'm not like the others, the unjust, the swindlers, the adulterers. And God, thank you I'm not like this tax collector. As a matter of fact, God, thank you that I fast twice a week and Tithe off of all that I've been given. God, I just thank you. You've blessed me so much in this life. I'm so glad that I'm not like other people. Now, what he just did there was read the rap sheet of everybody else around him, right? Swindlers, adulterers, unjust, this tax collector. He's ripping people off. And he measured that rap sheet against his resume, right? Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, I tithe and I fast. Jesus told this parable to some people that were trusting in themselves that they were righteous. And they were looking down on other people with contempt. The parable finishes with the tax collector unwilling to lift his eyes toward heaven. He's beating his, his chest and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you that it's the tax collector that walked away justified rather than the Pharisee. So what is Jesus talking about? Do not judge so that you will not be judged. He's saying, don't stand in self-righteous hypocrisy. Don't place yourself in the position of a judge over one another. Look here in verse 2. He says, for in the way that you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Now, this standard of measure... It was like a measuring rod that they would use. And so you would lay it up against a particular object, a block of stone, or whatever you wanted to measure. And you would see, does it measure up? Does it measure correctly? Now again, what the Pharisees were doing, they're measuring everybody else with a certain standard and themselves with another. I don't know how this works out in your life. But any of my deficiencies, I can tell you exactly why that thing happened and why you should be gracious toward me when I make mistakes. Like, for other people, when they sin against me or you cut me off in traffic or you said that thing in that way, I'm like, how could anyone ever talk to somebody else like that? Like, that's completely unacceptable. Like, you should never speak that way to somebody. That's not okay. But when I talk to you that way, I'm like, listen, man. I'm just glad I didn't cuss you because I've been up all night and I haven't had sleep for days and people have been calling me and I've got all these things going. I'm glad it wasn't worse. right? We see ourselves in context and other people outside of context. We measure other people with one standard and ourselves with another. And Jesus said, hey, that's, that's not how we're supposed to live. As people who are salt and light in the world, citizens of the kingdom of God, we should not judge so that we won't be judged. The standard we're going to use against others will be used against us. Look here in verse 3. Jesus asked the question, Why? Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, there's a log in your eye. You Hypocrite. You person who judges other people with one standard and yourself with another, you hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now, Jesus is using hyperbole here. It's a fairly extreme example. It envisions a person looking for a tiny little speck in somebody else's eye while they have a log in their own. It's intended to almost evoke silliness like that that seems crazy and yet among the pharisees among the jews and i dare say among ourselves we have a tendency for this to be true 
Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has been walking us through, hey, you have heard it said, you're not supposed to kill somebody. But I say to you, you got anger and bitterness and contempt in your heart, you're already guilty before the Supreme Court. You've heard it said, you're not supposed to commit adultery. But I say to you, if you got lust in your heart, you're guilty. What Jesus is helping to show the Pharisees and the Jews and anyone who would listen is that if we just measure ourselves externally, did we meet the righteous requirements of the law, we've not gone near far enough. He's going to go on to say that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And he calls on us to be perfect as his Father in heaven was or is perfect. We shouldn't step up on our self-righteous pedestals because none of us are righteous. The Scripture says no one is righteous, not even one. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the righteous requirement of Jesus. When we lay that measuring rod against our lives, we, we fall short. Like we don't measure up. We're sinful. I really wanted to tell you guys about the story of a terrible deacons meeting I was in. Like, if I've ever wanted to, like, quit ministry, I was really young, former church, and a group of deacons, they brought a guy in, and they literally read his rap sheet. This guy can't serve in our church. Something he'd done 10 years ago that I think he got, like, the charges got dismissed, and it was ugly, and it was awful. And I wanted to tell you guys that story to illustrate how our hearts can become deceived. We see other people's sin. We don't see our own. But I need to tell you a better illustration. And it's a story of my life. As a kid, I, insecure, carried some shame and guilt around with me. You know what felt so good to me? Just, just to take a little step up, to maybe be a little bit more critical of somebody else and a little less critical of myself because, hey, to stand on that pedestal and feel good for just a bit, man, that was wonderful. Now, the trouble was is I didn't seem to stay there because my life, I continued to fail, I continued to sin, I continued to like sin against other people or say things I shouldn't or get into things that I shouldn't. And so uh, the longer time went on, the better I had to get at spotting the struggles and the weaknesses, the specks in other people's eye, and the better I had to get at ignoring my own sin. I became an expert at seeing your sin and minimizing my own I lived decades of my life like this. Convincing myself that other people weren't as good as me. Deceiving myself that my sin wasn't all that significant. At least I was trying. And I heard a lot of people stepping up on my pedestal, looking down with others with contempt. And then... I came face to face with my own sin. I did something I swore I would never do. I engaged in an inappropriate conversation with a woman who wasn't my wife. And when I confessed with my wife and I saw how badly I'd hurt her, there was no denying my sin. There was no explaining it away, there was no justifying it, there was no pretending anymore. It was clear that God wasn't going to let me minimize it. The facade of my own self-righteousness had been demolished. I thought my marriage and my ministry were over. And that's what I deserved. I confessed to Brittany. And that was really tough. Confessed to my pastor. And then I called a friend of mine. Man, could you pray for me? Could you pray for my marriage? Like, he's like, tell me what, what's going on. And as I kind of told him the story, he's like, Man, I'm so sorry. Like, man, I'm so sorry. I'm here for you. Like, how can I help you? What can I do? And over the next days and weeks and months, he and his wife, with 
extraordinary grace and mercy and tenderness ministered to us and walked through us or walked with us through what was the most difficult season in our lives to date. See, in that moment, he didn't stand over me in judgment. But he stood there with me as a brother. He didn't lie to me and tell me that what was true wasn't true. Isn't that how our culture usually does it? Hey, don't judge me. Don't, don't speak the truth to me. And don't tell me that what I'm doing is somehow wrong. Don't tell me that, that my behavior isn't good and that you're not supposed to judge. You're not supposed to point those things out. That was not the point of Jesus at all in this text. Matter of fact, he's not telling us we shouldn't say things to people. We shouldn't address the truth at all. But he is telling us that we shouldn't stand in self-righteous judgment, hypocritical judgment over other people, but instead we should step down off of our self-righteous pedestals as judges and instead to stand with one another as brothers and sisters. The truth of it is, is that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. I pray you never go through something like I did. But I know you're going to go through something. The church of Jesus Christ and being salt and light to the world are not people who stand on pedestals. We're the people who are with those who are hurting. We comfort those who are mourning and hurting and find themselves in the midst of sin. We are like the good Samaritan. We go to the people in the ditch and we begin to care for them and love them through their situation. There was a well-worn path in my own life, holding someone else's sin against them and ignoring my own. And Jesus would say, like, that's not the way. That's not where you find life. That's empty. That's a, that's a never-ending job of acting like you're something that you're not, trying to justify yourself before God. What Jesus is telling us here is that the posture of our heart matters we as the people of God should be very concerned about the truth of God. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth. Can I just, a little bit of a side here to the church, say we need to stand on the truth. Like we live in a world where you can say up is down and right is wrong and everyone's going to applaud you as long as you don't come across as judgy, right? We need to be able to stand on the truth. God created the heavens and the earth and what we can know about the world has been made noble to us by God, truth is important. And yet, the way that we communicate that truth to the world, the way that we speak the truth to one another, really, really matters. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul says, if I speak in the tongue of men and of angels, but I have not love, when I speak the truth to people, if I'm 100% right, if I won the Facebook argument, I've got all the facts on my side, but I do not have love, he says, you're like a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. We have nothing. So this text isn't telling us not to speak the truth. It's actually teaching us how to speak the truth in love. And the question for us is, are we self-righteous judges or... Are we brothers walking with brothers and sisters through what are difficult seasons in their lives? We, at the conference yesterday, a couple of the guys who, who stood up talking, they made this statement that stood out to me. They said, a man who possesses boldness without brokenness is just a bully. We who would declare truth without humility, we're just bullies, clanging cymbals, gongs to the world. You may be right, but you're still wrong. But when we have the truth and brokenness, when we can speak that truth in love, we have an opportunity to win our brother. This is Ephesians 4.15. The church at Ephesus, there was, kind of like today, there's all sorts of philosophies and ideas floating around about how people should live, what they should believe. There's all these unique ideas that are circulating. And, and Paul says this in Ephesians 4.15. He says, as a result, we are no longer to be children. Like kids, you can make them believe anything, right? You can sell them oceanfront property in Arizona. Like that's, You can do that to a kid. We're not supposed to be children tossed here and there by waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up. 
in all aspects is into him who is the head, even Christ. Isn't that interesting? The way that we would avoid being like waves of the sea, blown and tossed, buying into every uh, new idea, every deceitful scheme. The way that we would grow up into the head, into Christ, is by speaking the truth in love to one another. Can I just say this to you? You will never become everything that God wants you to be on your own. The trouble with us is that we deceive ourselves pretty well. We use one standard for other people and another standard for ourselves. We can become easily deceived, and we need people who can speak the truth in love to us. One of the reasons that we have one of our core values of community that says admonish one another faithfully is because we pretty easily go off the rails. Like We, we can get distracted. We can become deceived. We can buy into one of the crazy doctrines floating around. We don't always see ourselves all that well. James 5, 19 and 20 says, My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. We've got to love each other enough to tell one another the truth. When you see your brother or sister going astray, you need to say something. You need to speak up. As a matter of fact, here at Cross Community Church, we have asked our members, like in our, our membership covenant that we ask everyone to sign, like what we're saying is, hey, we're in this together. What I understand about myself is sometimes I'm going to go off the rails. Like I'm going to, I'm going to have a tendency to wonder, and I want you to fight for me. If you see me in error, I want you to speak the truth in love to me. Like we're going to be a body that fights for one another. And we're going to strive to turn one another from the error of our ways because we want to follow Jesus. We know the path is narrow and it's difficult to walk and we're not going to get there alone. We need to speak the truth to one another in love. Jesus isn't telling us we shouldn't tell people the truth. Listen. If you've said, don't judge me to somebody, it's probably a cop-out. There's probably something there you don't want to deal with. Because Jesus says, hey, don't judge one another for by the standard you use going to be used to you. Then he turns around and he says, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye but don't notice the log in yours? In verse 5 he says, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then right, we address our sin first, but then... Look what we get busy doing for one another because we love each other, right? Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Everybody in this scenario has something in their eye, right? Every one of us has something in our lives that people could speak to. We need each other. It's been said the church is the only army in the world that shoots their wounded. And that's not who Jesus has called us to be. If your marriage is broken, you're in the right place. If your life is full of addiction, you're in the right place. Man, you got sin struggles you can't handle, you're in the right place. If your heart is broken and you need comfort, you're in the right place. Like, one of the things we're committed to doing here at Cross Community is leading with a limp. I don't tell you my story because I'm proud of what happened. I tell you the story because I'm thankful that men and women surrounded me, and I'm thankful that God has restored my marriage, and I'm thankful that we can look back on those brutal, awful days where I wasn't sure if my marriage was going to make it, and we can praise God for what He has done. This is a place where it's safe. It's okay to not be okay. But we're not going to leave you there either. We're going to speak the truth to one another in love. We're going to get the log out of our own eye. We're going to go after the speck that may be in yours. Every one of us here has fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone in this room deserves death and eternal separation from God in a place called hell. That's what we deserve. And yet, for those of us who have come to faith in Jesus, we've been shown extraordinary grace and mercy and love. And it's my prayer that that's what we would show the people around us. So, how do we admonish one another faithfully? How do we speak the truth in love? Because this can be tricky. Anyone ever try to do this and it didn't go so well? I would argue that most of the time when I've tried to do this, it hasn't gone all that well. This can be a, a difficult process. So, um, number one, how do I speak the truth in love? Um, first, get your eye examined. Before you ever think, I'm going to go tell them, I'm going to go straighten them out, I'm going to point out this thing in their life, you ought to be looking in the mirror. You ought to be inviting this in your own life. Hey, 
hey, we're, we've been walking together in community for a while. I just want you to know, if you see something in me, I, I need you to address it. You ask people, is there anything in my life that you see that doesn't belong in the life of a believer? You get your eye examined. Because here's the thing. You've got no business doing surgery on someone else when you got something in your eye, right? You ever think that Jesus used the eye here? Because we get splinters in lots of places. I've never had one in my eye, to be honest with you, thankfully. But he uses the eye here because it's a very sensitive organ of the body, right? Like, you're coming at my eye, I'm probably going to fight you. Like, I need to know that you're being careful. Like, I need to know that you're, that you're not just, like, kind of haphazardly going in after this, but you're going with care. So first, you get your eye examined. And that gives us the humility needed to make sure we're not standing on our self-righteous pedestal, but instead, we're regarding one another as brothers and sisters, loving each other through whatever they might be going through. Number two, if you're going to admonish faithfully, you're going to go get the speck out of somebody's eye, you need lots of light. Lots of light. And that means you need to spend ample time in prayer and study of God's Word. Admonishing faithfully means telling people what the Word of God has to say about what's going on in their life. And if you can't answer the question, what does God's Word have to say about that, you're not ready to admonish. You're not ready to go and get that splinter. Spend time studying the Word. What's really going on here? Seeking to understand the situation. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And we're convinced according to the Word of God, that we see something, we spend a lot of time in prayer asking the Spirit to go ahead of us. Hey, I've got to speak some hard truth, and this, this isn't normally a, an easy thing. But God, would you be at work in their heart before I say anything? Would you guide every word? Would you guide every, every action, every attitude in this conversation? So you get your eye examined, you go with lots of light, and then with careful discernment, you speak the truth. Two words there. The first word is careful. I pointed out, like, the eye is sensitive, so we don't go haphazardly. You know, some people that are like, they're just the super blunt ones. They're not terribly sensitive in the way that they say things. Now, wouldn't it be a tragedy if someone didn't hear the truth of what you were saying, not because it wasn't true, but because of how you delivered it? So when we're going to confront one another, we do that with care, consideration. If you know how to talk in such a way they're going to hear, you speak in that way. And the second part here, careful, and then discernment. Look what Jesus says in verse 6. He says, Don't give what is holy to dogs, and don't throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet, and they will tear you to pieces. And the truth here is that dogs don't appreciate what's holy, and pigs don't care about pearls. That we should be discerning about who we go to, when we go to them, like we should be careful and discerning. Is this a brother or sister in Christ? Do you have a relationship with them that says you can speak the truth to them? we got to be discerning. Like the last thing we want to be is like the, that church in the community. They're like, oh gosh, here comes one of those people from cross community. They're about to unload on me, right? Like that's, that's not who we want to be. So we need to use exercise discernment. If they are a brother or sister in Christ, I would say you have a responsibility to go and to speak the truth and love to them. But if they're not, it may be like throwing pearls to a pig. No appreciation, no value, not understanding the worth of what they've been given there. For unbelievers, rather than speaking truth, it may be time just to be salt and light to them. Colossians 4, 5, and 6 says, Conduct yourself with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Ephesians 2 tells us that people who don't know Christ, they are dead in trespasses and sins. Reasoning with dead people, speaking the truth to dead people, it, it, not going to get us very far. Like oftentimes for us, we look out at the world, and I know many of us are concerned about the world and what's going on out there. Can I tell you that the primary message that the world needs is not what you're doing is wrong. The primary message that the world needs is the gospel of Jesus Christ, where God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love for us, he takes us who were dead in trespasses and sins, 
and he makes us alive together with him. You know, new creations exhibit new behaviors. Dead things only decay. So when you look out of the world and you're like, oh, the moral decay and the world's terrible, like, don't get up in arms. Like, that's to be expected. What the world needs is the gospel. And so when we seek to speak the truth in love, to admonish one another faithfully, we get our eyes examined, we go with lots of light, and then we go with careful discernment, speaking the truth in love to one another. A few questions for us, and then we're going to close. Number one, are you a self-righteous judge? Are you that person that minimizes your own sin Focusing in on the sin of others? Are you the person who fails to love your brother or sister well because you see him walking off a cliff and you're too polite to say anything? How loving is that? Number three, when was the last time you sat down and examined your own life? You looked in the mirror. Look to the Word of God and say, God, would you reveal the things in me, the ways in me that aren't pleasing before you? Are you spending time in the Word, hiding that Word in your heart? Number five, are you walking in careful discernment? Let me pray for us. Father, I pray that we would be a people who doesn't stand in self-righteous judgment over the world, but we would be light in the midst of the darkness, that we would bring the truth of God to bear in any given situation. But Father, I pray that every time we bring that truth, it would be done in love, that we would be wise and discerning individuals, that we would fight for one another when we see each other going off the rails, getting into trouble, being deceived, that we would speak the truth in love. But Father, help us to be discerning about when to say, what to say, what to say in those situations. God, may we be a people who because of the fellowship here, because the truth is spoken, that we grow up into the fullness. We've said our mission, we want to lead all people to become fully devoted disciples. And Father, we know that won't happen without each other speaking the truth in love. I pray that that would happen in our midst. Lord, I pray that you would work in us this morning. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.